You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, or his ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Exodus twenty seventeen. Hello, welcome to Geekdom of God. I'm your host, Santir, and today I'm going to talk about the Tenth Commandment. The Tenth Commandment is rather different. While most of the other commandments prohibit actions, the Tenth Commandment prohibits something internal, coveting. Coveting is desiring what someone else has. While covetousness is generally rooted in the belief that someone else's life is better than one's own due to whatever it is that is coveted, the responses to this belief are quite varied. These responses tend to fall into a few broad categories. Negative emotions, selfishness, destruction, and theft. Let's examine each of these categories in more depth. The first category is negative emotions. These develop when we compare our lives to someone else's and judge ours as inferior in some way. This category can easily develop into one of the other three if we act based on these emotions. In general, I think that most of the emotions that spawn from covetousness fall under the broad classification of discontentment. Being discontent is often held up in our society as a positive motivator, a way to encourage people to strive for more. And while it certainly can do just that, I don't think embracing the motivational power of discontentment is a good thing. This is because discontentment robs us of two incredibly important things, joy and thankfulness. It does this by focusing us on what we don't have rather than on what we do have. I think it is possible to desire more from our lives and to seek growth in ways that push against entropy and stagnation without relying on the joy and thankfulness destroying discontentment. As Christians, we are called to be content in and thankful to God. Covetous discontentment runs against that and idolizes what others have. Instead, we should learn to be content in Christ, as Paul did. He expresses this type of contentment in Philippians 4, 11-13. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. We must learn to be content, because if we don't, we never will be, no matter how much we obtain or achieve. Both the one with little and the one with much can be discontent with what they have, and both can focus on what they lack. In this passage, Paul challenges us to learn to focus on what we do have and be content with it. For we have salvation in Christ and a loving God who knows our needs and has promised to fulfill them. Let us be content in that. This brings us to the second category, which is selfishness. Specifically, this is the type of selfishness that completely disregards others in the pursuit of its own desires. This kind of selfish ambition can be entered into through both greed and envy. It will do whatever it can to achieve its goals, including trampling others and engaging in any number of shady practices to get what it wants. This type of ambition believes that the ends justify the means, and as such, it shows neither pity nor mercy and forsakes love. Again, Paul has instruction for us on this matter in Philippians, this time from Philippians 2, 3-4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Here, Paul instructs a few things. The first is that we should not be motivated by selfish ambitions. He also instructs us to be humble and to value others above ourselves. This sort of valuation sees each person equally, and because we are only one individual, we do not value ourselves more highly than multiple individuals. As such, we should be careful to not place our interests above the aggregate interests of others. Note that Paul doesn't tell us to not value ourselves. Rather, Christians should mutually support each other and help each other to attend to each person's interests. This requires us to trust ourselves to each other, which is a fragile thing, but it is also a far better way to live. But I've wandered off on a bit of a digression. Returning to the main topic, the third category of things that covetousness can cause is destruction. This often manifests as wanting to, in some way, bring low or otherwise damage the individual that possesses whatever is coveted. This can be pursued in a lot of ways, but it always carries an element of malice and often hatred. The most common way that this is enacted is through slander. Whether it tries to cost someone their job, destroy their relationships, or damage their reputation, such malevolent attacks are meant to ruin the person. The covetous individual typically turns to destruction when they feel like it is impossible for them to obtain the object of their coveting. They are probably miserable, for reasons expressed in the section on the negative emotion category. Thus, because they cannot obtain, they try to destroy. Such an individual sees the possessor of that which they covet as being in a better state than they themselves are in, and so, because they do not feel that they can achieve that preferable state, they try to drag the other person down to where they are by inflicting misery on them. 
In extreme cases, this can also get physically violent. It can even result in murder. James talks some about this in James 4, 1 through 3. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. James makes it clear how much dissension coveting brings and the hostile atmosphere it creates. And he makes it clear that covetousness brings forth wrong motives and directs us away from God. And finally, the fourth category of the results of covetousness is theft. This one is pretty straightforward. Simply put, if one covets something that someone else has, the covetous one may respond by trying to steal whatever that thing is. If a material object, then by physically taking it. If it's something immaterial, then often lies and manipulations are used. Regardless of the means, theft is clearly wrong. I even did an entire episode on it, given that the Eighth Commandment expressly forbids stealing. I should also add that adultery can be entered into as part of this category, though it isn't the only reason adultery occurs, of course. From this examination, we can see that all of these categories can easily become entwined, especially in how they're expressed. However, all of these expressions derive from a covetous heart. In fact, both Jesus and James make it clear that all sin has its source from within, from wickedness in the heart. Let's look at Matthew 15, 16 to 20, and James 1, 13 to 15. Let's start with the Matthew passage. For some context, the Pharisees got angry at Jesus because Jesus' disciples didn't follow the tradition of washing their hands before they eat. This was more than a mere cleansing and held a ritual, ceremonial significance to them. Jesus responds by speaking against the Pharisees and the way they ignore what God really said in favor of obedience to their traditions. Later, the disciples ask Jesus to explain what he was talking about. His response is recorded for us in Matthew 15, 16 to 20. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. The Pharisees believed that eating with unwashed hands would cause a person to become defiled. Jesus makes it clear, however, that it is what comes from within, evil thoughts, that lead to sin and therefore defile a person. James elaborates on this concept in James 1, 13-15. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Here, James describes the life cycle, or should that be death cycle, of sin. He makes it clear that sin starts as an internal evil desire by which a person is enticed. This is the process of temptation. That evil desire is a seed that germinates into sin, which then brings death. Without the internal evil desire, a person cannot be tempted and therefore would not sin. This is precisely why God does not sin. He has no evil desires, and thus he cannot be tempted into sin. God clearly understands how devastating evil desires are. Covetousness is particularly destructive, especially to groups. So, while there are many evil desires God could have made as part of the Ten Commandments, it makes sense to me that he would especially highlight coveting. The way to escape the damaging power of covetousness is to look upon that which we have with thankfulness, to joyfully receive whatever gifts God gives us, and to learn to be content with them. May we do just that. Until next time, take care everyone. Bye bye Thank you for listening to this week's Geekdom of God podcast. To support this program, go to patreon.com slash cntier. For more, you can visit geekdomofgod.com. Finally, you can email cntier at cntier at geekdomofgod.com.